Today's interview is with Hamal Badiani. Um, Hamal is a very interesting guy who started out as a management consultant and traveled all over doing that, but he realized he didn't want to be away from his kids and he realized he was trading his time for dollars. So he started investing in real estate. So he talks about how he's a little bit of a contrarian, how he likes to go against the grain um, and how he's managed to scale his business and you know what he's learned along the way. So really interesting interview. As always, like and subscribe on Wrestling With Real Estate, the YouTube channel. Go to the WWRE podcast and give me a five star rating and write me a review if you think it's worthy. And I'm looking to speak to as many of you as possible. If you guys like real estate investing, if you're active, if you're if you haven't done anything yet, I'd love to get to know you. See if there's any way I can help you. So there's a link in the description below. I'll go to wrestlingwithrealestate.com, the website, and sign up there. I'd love to hear more about you. But before that, enjoy today's great interview with Hamal. Welcome to Wrestling with Real Estate, where we look to choke slam all your real estate problems. I'm your host, former WWE wrestler, and now Cirque du Soleil performer, and of course, multifamily real estate investor, Barry Griffiths. Now today we're joined by Hamal. Hey Hamal, how are you doing, man? I'm doing fantastic and really excited to be here, man. Thank you for inviting me. Of this course, man. Thank you for being mine. here. <laughs> Two of my passions, wrestling, I was a big fan growing up. Uh, looking at Undertaker and kind of the, the urn, and it was just amazing. Paul <laughs> um, Bear, know, right, carrying the, the Paul Bear. Yeah, the yeah, it was, uh, it was amazing how you know the lesson learned was uh, well, whoever slams you down, you got to get back up, no matter <laughs> that, what, man. Sometimes, that is a brilliant. Sometimes you need a mentor to help you uh, <laughs> or a coach to help you. <laughs> you that go. is brilliant. I never thought about that. Yeah, when he would yeah. sit right up, that was brilliant. Was, yeah. What a character. Yeah. He probably has to go down as one of the best characters in the history of wrestling, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool, very cool. Well, before we jump into the conversation, do you want to tell us a little bit about your background and what you're currently focused on? Yeah, my background is in uh, management consulting prior to real estate. So, you know, 15 years, I was on the plane every week uh, across three continents helping Fortune 100 companies, their CEOs and COs, helping their organizations to be scaled, merged, shaped around, you know, if they're going through any sort of issues or big strategies, you know, big products. So worked with everyone from Disney theme parks to the Vatican uh, during those days. Mm -hmm. It was uh, unbelievable, but great perspective sitting across the desk of so many smart people. And as I pivoted to Real estate investing, uh, you know, that I try and bring in those competencies to my own business. Um, we mainly focus on commercial real estate across multiple asset classes across the nation. So we focus on multifamily, land acquisitions, building new development, uh, triple net leases, office buildings, uh, and we're looking to expand into vertical integration, provide property management, asset management. So all things real estate, man. That's 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 our goal and our company's vision. Very cool. So how, how did you end up transitioning from from uh, managing consultant consultancy right to to real estate? What what was how was that how was that transition and what sparked it? Yeah, the spark was uh, seemingly one of the biggest tragic days of my life. I, one random evening, uh, I was up in Boston uh, and my daughter, my, I have twin kids. Uh, my daughter uh, twin was uh, one year old and got a call from my wife that she had a skull fracture. Um, and, you know, I was physically so far away from Boston to Charlotte, just coming before I first finding a flight, driving, going to, to the airport, coming here supporting my family and, and, you know, all the while being overwhelmed with emotions of a child going through any sort of trauma or surgery. Um, it was just an unbelievable moment and just sparked something in my life where I said, I need to stop renting out my time where I was working 80 hour weeks and how do I focus on building life on my own terms, whatever limited aspect of life, whether it's 50 years or five years that is remaining how do I focus on what's important? So 
that sparked a journey towards shifting my job from uh, not traveling to, you know, well, traveling to completely being remote and, and then really spark what I, what I call my true calling is investments in the real estate world, which I'd grown up uh, with a family of businesses. So I understood the concept. Uh, it was just a matter of executing and scaling on it. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing that. You know, that's as a parent myself, I can only imagine what that call must have been like at that time, you know, and um, you touched on something really interesting there is that, um, you know, you're exchanging your time for dollars, right? And someone yeah. on, on one of the interviews, and I, I wish I could remember who it was, they, they, they went one step further. We're not exchanging just our time for dollars. We're exchanging our kids' time for dollars, right? So if we are away from my son, your daughter, your other son, Absolutely. we're exchanging their time because they only have a limited amount of time with us as well. And especially when they're growing up, they, you know, I feel like they need us around. And we're exchanging yeah. that time for dollars as well, you know? And it's when someone told me that, that was like, that was like a, a a punch to the gut right because it's one thing yeah. for me to be wasting my time and not be doing but when i'm wasting my son's time I'm, you know your kid's time is just something completely different yeah and it's such a profound statement right once you start thinking that way you're like oh my god I'm, i have to be so ruthless with my time and what am i focusing my energy uh what am i saying what am i thinking and where am i spending every minute and you start doing that so consciously suddenly your life's trajectory changes so i'm actually glad my wife my daughter turned out to be okay she didn't need any surgery but i'm glad that incident happened because it's completely shaped my life over the last four years uh, just, just because of that one incident yeah I'm, I'm i'm very glad she's okay as well it's it's crazy how one thing can really change the trajectory of your life, right? You know, yeah. when you were going that week away for that trip, you had no idea that it was going to change for the better, right? Through a tragic yeah. circumstances, unfortunately, but it yeah. changed for the better. And, you know, that obviously this is real estate related, but it's kind of mindset stuff as well. Because it's amazing what you realize as well. Once you realize you have that power to control your life and create the life that you want, right? You know, like you talked about, you were gone all the time and you wanted to be home with your kids and spend more time with them and that when that happened, you had that realization that, that, okay, I need to do something. And then I'm sure as it grew, you realized, okay, I can do this. I have the power to do this. I can create this life for myself. Yeah. I think once exactly. people realize that it's just unbelievable for, for people, you know? Yep. Very cool. Very cool. So what, what, what was it about real estate that attracted you to it? Uh, uh, you know, people can invest in stocks, they can invest in Bitcoin, they can invest in their own businesses, you know, yeah. there's all kinds of other stuff that you can invest in. What brought you to real estate? Yeah, it's, it's a couple of things, right? One, I mean, any point, I come from a family of very hardworking people, business owners, right? So we were always about, never had luck in our family in terms of speculation or gambling of any sort. Um, so I've never won a can of Coke in my life, right? Any <laughs> bingo raff, waffles or raffles and you just nothing ever works where we we don't have to pay our dues first before we get to achieve something. So I always knew that growing up. And to me, you know, anytime I've dabbled in any other things like Bitcoins at stock market, it just became speculation on our end. And it just, um, you know, created this interesting phenomena where I would try and miss time the, the, or time the market miss times. And it just didn't work out for me. So to me, real estate is truly one a very hard asset, right? especially multifamily people, you know, you're talking about housing for people. So having that hard asset in your mind uh, and something tangible that you're investing in, having a very predictable type of understanding. Now there's always risk in every type of investment that you make, but understanding uh, very simply what, what could happen to an asset, taking it from X to Y in terms of appreciation or bettering the community, what, what exactly could be the returns and what are the risks associated with it. It allows me to have a better sense for myself and my hard-earned investment um, uh, dollars along with people who co-invest with our company to be able to say, hey, this is a really nice opportunity for us to put money in and slowly and predictably it grows. So that was one thing. And the second thing was just real estate of all kinds, right? We think, even think about giving back. We think about giving back uh, for our company, Exponential Equity. We like to provide um, money for tax foreclosures, uh, people to get them the, the tax foreclosures waived off, or we 
we have a vision of buying large tracts of land for growing trees and you know helping support climate change so the, the beauty of real estate is you impact so many lives right by just bettering a housing community or an office building so many businesses can be supported and you know your kids lives uh, other people's lives with houses can be saved your kids lives with the climate change you know the generations to come you can really leave an impact that all the other asset classes when you think about investments in commodities or other transactions of bitcoin or otherwise it's more to make money it's not to leave a legacy or make an impact so that for me impact is a bigger deal than making money and that's really cool. You, you you explained it fantastically well there. I like I like how you talked about how, you know, real estate has a lot of predict predictability to it, right? It's not completely predictable. You could have a fire next week or a tornado yeah. or whatever, right? But they're, they're obviously these things, and, you know, we can't control the market. But you, what you can control is that income stream, right? You can control rents to some extent, how much you can push rents, you know, other income that you can create in the, the property, as well as the expenses as well. And these things you have control over and you have control over yeah. the asset. And that's, you know, you have a, a, like you said, it's so true. It's a kind of a predictable outcome to some extent, right? You can kind of see the trajectory of the property over the next few years, if you do everything right, operationally manage, management that yeah. property, right? So, and it's a hard asset. Uh, yeah, I, that I, I feel exactly like you about real estate. I think it's, it's, it's phenomenal. And there's you know, so much good that we can do, like you said as well, right? It's sometimes I was speaking to someone about this yesterday that landlords get a, an unfair um, stigma around them i think that we're only in it for the money right yes of course yeah. we're in it for the money to some extent but the, the money is also isn't the money it's that that life that we're creating but we're doing good for the most part most people like ourselves right the idea is to take a property that is not so nice make it nice so yeah. that the tenants have a great place to live and then everyone benefits from that right the tenants have a safe and nice place to live we we make some money we bring on investors that can invest with us they 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 better their lives they get a good return they invest in real estate and it's just a win-win all around so i think sometimes yeah. i get lost on people it's a win-win-win yeah absolutely so yeah. What, what was your first uh, venture into real estate what was your first ever investment yeah so we've been uh growing passively our single family portfolio, right? Even when I was in the consulting world and didn't have the time to actively engage in any sort of investments, mm -hmm. we've, we've had a portfolio of uh, single family houses, some land that we've invested in, enjoyed tremendous returns. It was a great time from a market cycle perspective, 2012 onwards that we've been investing. So it's been eight years. Uh, the active component, really, we, the commercial side, we started uh, beginning of 2020. Okay. And so our first uh, passive investment in a real estate syndication or group investment was uh, April of this year. And uh, that was for three communities, uh, around 430 uh, apartments, new build and and stabilized assets across the Southeast. So we're very excited about the cities that we invested in and the, the, the work we're doing there. Oh, wow. What, what a time to start investing in commercial 2020. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, well, I, and that goes against the, you know, the, the against the grain uh, thesis I have. A lot of people paused, um, you know, the summertime of 2020. Now people are coming back. Uh, but to me, if you look at the macroeconomics uh, of the, the federal government printing a lot of money, uh, a lot of other asset classes, you know, beyond the stock market, like hotels and retail, uh, all the folks that used to invest in those asset classes now thinking about, you know, classes like multifamily and repositioning them, there's just uh, so much um, interest in uh, this particular asset class that it's always for the next five years, I don't see it, you know, slowing down. And uh, we are actually, this is our best professional year because we started the company, we invested passively in 20, April, and then we did two active deals uh, in September alone. So we closed on 330 units that we are actively managing uh, just a couple of months back. So exciting times and we're looking forward to gaining that momentum and just building on it across multiple asset classes now wow 
that's fantastic. Well, congratulations, first and foremost. That's really cool. Um, going back to the passive deal to start off with, right? You invested passively. Um, why did you start passively? Why, why, why not go into the active role to start off with? Yeah, it's, it's understanding the process, right? So my competency coming from the consulting world is all about how do I build a business, right? It's all, some people invest for the freedom uh, and the financial stability that real estate would provide, right? My passion is building a business, a true ethical uh, integrated brand that is premier in the Carolinas that serves the nation in, in the real estate community and world. Right. So for me to build that kind of business, you know, if I look at my days of the CEOs and I, the, the folks that I used to help, whenever they would be looking to expand beyond their comfort zone, they would look at market research. We would bring in data from other companies and say, hey, this is what Amazon is doing. Even though you might be in the banking world, you might want to learn a thing or two on how they serve their customers, etc. So to me, being on the other side of the table and understanding what should I expect from multiple folks? Um, what should I expect as a customer, as an investor? Well, one, the type of communication that I receive, the type of transparency that I should receive. Uh, what if things go wrong or go south? What should I expect? It was re very, very important uh, for me to talk to someone with conviction and say, I've done this. And, and so for that reason, you know, investing heavily passively first learning about the process on the job on the other side of the table before we provide our active organization and building around it and taking all the best practices for other people that might be doing things different way and building our culture and our business is super important. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, I, I, I did the same. I invested passively two years ago now or nearly two years ago. Yeah. And it was a great learning experience, right? For one, yeah. you're getting a return on your money, if nothing else, right? I was getting an 8% preferred return, 70-30 split, which is yeah. a great, a great deal in itself. A, a huge asset, 450 units, right? I would never, ever be able to buy that myself. I have yeah. a small part of that I own, you know? But still, yeah. I'm involved in that deal. I'm insulated by the size of that deal. And yeah. I, just like you said, I see their underwriting. I see the webinar before, you know, um, I see how they report. Do they give monthly reports? Do they give weekly? Do they yeah. give quarterly yeah. reports? When yeah. do they do distributions? What do those yeah. distributions look like? You know, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's been a, a great, just from the thing I was in, rather than paying someone to teach me that I got a return for it as well, yeah, which, exactly. is, really cool, which exactly. is really cool. Yeah. I love that. Um, how did you, how did you choose the syndication syndication group that you, that you went with? Cause I think that's a challenge for a lot of passive investors, right? And it's an important challenge that they need to understand. Yeah. How, how did you come to, to that decision? Yeah, it was, it was knowing, knowing my, myself, right. And where my vision was, right. Again, I was not doing it for one transaction or two transactions. I said, can I build my depth around this business and become an operating partner? Yes, I can over five years worth of work uh, supporting someone. I can really understand all aspects of construction costs and project management in the real estate world. Or can I really knowing for, again from tapping into my consulting experience that that's where I got to know so many random, unique, different people. Every time, every client was different. Every team was different. So interacting with people, you understand their strengths, their motivations, what kind of alignment of values and vision they have, and was really able to attract a consortium of operating partners across multiple asset classes and said, okay, guys, this, this is a good team now that I, of people that I can trust knowing to, to do their job with their strengths because they come from two decades worth of construction experience that I would take five years or seven years to build on. Can I build my business around supporting these partners and complementing their skill sets by finding good uh, uh, opportunities, uh, bringing in my own capital, other capital, helping support the legal side of the business, the marketing side of the business, and while we are building our own internal property management and asset management or operating experience, uh, can we do, uh, you know, a one-two punch, right? Scale uh, in, in support with all other partners um, and build our own things 
in the meantime in terms of systems and processes. That's the route we took. And you know, my favorite saying is you'd rather have one percent effort of a hundred people than hundred percent of your own, right? So to me, the only way to scale is to have a lot of people that you can trust um, and a team that's and a vision to build around it. Now, every time you don't get, you know, a home run in terms of partnerships and some partnerships don't work out. And, you know, fortunately we've been, we've been very quick in realizing who we want to work with, who we don't. So, so far we've just been blessed with a great people that we've connected with and, and support us. Very cool. Very cool. Um, so then you went, you said in September of this year, you went and did your own, Two we did two possible. deals, yeah. yeah, two deals co co sponsoring uh, with other operating partners, uh, and now we are locked in into two contracts that we're doing it completely on our own. So this will be our deals, our due diligence. Um, you know, we're tying up with uh, good again, good operating partners who would support us, but everything from soup to nuts, including our processes and our systems. Now we are ready. If you've learned enough to do this on our own. Um, so that's, this is an exciting time for us. Yeah, that's, that's um, you're growing quickly, right? So it's, uh, it's yeah. great to see that you, you guys are doing that. So on, as, as co-sponsors, what, we, what was your guys' role on those two deals that you closed in September? Yeah, so it's uh, three things, marketing, uh, capital, and uh, boots on the ground, right? So helping audit the property at least monthly, if not quarterly, uh, by physically being there. Um, and making sure well, the two deals that we closed on were distressed assets, right? So the, they were communities that were lower occupancy, um, needed a heavier lift than most people would invest in. Uh, but we get excited about that because, because we really have a vision for how we can better that community. Uh, and through our sweat equity can, you know, value that asset from an investment standpoint quite a bit higher than what it was that we bought it at. Um, so, but that comes with a lot of active uh, on-site work, right? Um, if you're trying to put a lot of uh, capital expenditure, turning things around in the, in the exterior, putting swimming pools, dog parks, and really making that community you want to be able to be measuring and auditing the, the folks that are working on that on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's, that was one of our role. Um, and, and then, you know, helping with the overall capital structure, making sure that our money was invested and other folks' money was invested in it. And we all enjoyed the ample returns that this investments are, these investments are providing even now. Nice. Nice. And how, how do you guys find the co sponsors Were they, the people that you invested passively or, or was it outside of that? No. So uh, it was just pre COVID again, I hit once I realized that commercial real estate, especially multifamily was the way to go for me. I was very fortunate between January of 2020 and uh, just before COVID ended all travel, <laughs> um, attended three or four events and joined mentorships and uh, found a consortium of operating partners that I gelled well with and over the spring summertime period continued the conversation on how we can align on visions and transactions and so when it came down to finding an asset that could work we worked together with those two partners nice nice yeah both deals have a different partners oh okay okay also it's yeah. So what what is, uh, how many units is each is it a, a, a total of 350 units yeah, so it's one, one uh, is in Oklahoma, it's 208 units, and uh, one is in Louisiana, it's 128 units, so 330 units total. Okay, okay, oh, very, yeah. that's very cool. Yeah, again, that's a factor of scale, right? An operating partner taking a distressed asset, there's a lot of work from their side to be done. While we are not constrained uh, from our investment standpoint in one asset, right? So we don't have to do things sequentially and we can scale at a faster pace, which is, which is our goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you mentioned, um, before the interview, you kind of go against the, you seem to go against the grain a little bit, right? With your investments that kind of, you know, yeah. right now people might be a little bit scared of that heavier lift. I know people are doing it, but for the most part, I think people are a little bit scared of it. What, yeah. what made you guys go with that kind of business model considering, especially considering where we are with, COVID and the pandemic and everything like that. Yeah, it's, um, it's a lot of research and data, right? So 
understanding all real estate is local. So understanding the market, the sub market, right now, everybody, if, I think Warren Buffett said this when everybody's digging for gold, sell shovels, right? <laughs> so if you, <laughs> if you think about multifamily investments, most people say, oh, these are the top 10 MSAs. It's the Phoenix, the Dallas, the Charlotte, or the Austins of the world. And you buy everything about 1985 or 1990. And those are your cookie cutter deal and you're bidding against 50 other people and you tend to, you know, sometimes overpay or likely overpay. Um, and so that's one model. Our model is what, what else is out there? There has to be people living in other places, right? They might not be declining in population. They might not be the top 10 uh, cities in the United States, but they have good to steady a uh, diverse set of jobs. People still want to live there in great communities uh, and have stable population or slightly growing population and have some tailwinds associated with the market dynamics. Now, if you combine that with a direct to seller purchase without any broker fees, uh, the seller has some story on why they can manage, they want to get out of the asset um, and really buy it at a discounted price. Uh, 60 cents on a dollar, for example, then the the risk associated with some of the things that you would associate with a distressed asset goes away completely because the asset is performing at that price quite nicely. If you don't do anything to it, it still provides better returns than any other asset that you would invest in. So you can only go up from there. So that, that's been our philosophy. Now, those kinds of deals are harder and harder to find, right? These are unicorns because everybody right now <laughs> wants to sell the conventional way. So that, that's the reason why, again, against the grain is we, we've diversified our portfolio. We look for office building, we look for triple net leases. We bought a bunch of land in Charlotte that we were look, looking to develop uh, into multifamily or mixed use uh, development type of assets, along with our strategic positioning of you know, underwriting 80 to 100 deals a month uh, just on the multifamily side. So we've got a little machine going on, uh, very systematized, very disciplined, no emotions. It's all about the numbers when we're looking to procure properties or any type of assets and uh, just keep going. Wow. So you guys are underwriting 80 to 100, 100 deals a, a month. What yeah. Is, how are you guys doing that? What does that look like? Like I use many <laughs> two hours per deal, five hour, five minutes per yeah, deal. Yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, it's, uh, well, we have three, I have, I have a team of three in the acquisition side that, that are looking at deals. Um, and it's a mix of direct to seller outbound marketing and communication where, versus inbound broker relationships and understanding what's in the, on the market and trying to analyze both of that. But we have actually three levels of modeling, right? So we have a very hard three-step due diligence process um, you know, the first one could probably take 45 minutes uh, for a person to analyze, just understanding again, markets, school district, crime rate, uh, housing data, the property itself, numbers, expenses, um, and just doing a back of the napkin analysis over 45 minutes to an hour, whether that makes sense for us or not. And by this time we know you know, price per door, what could make sense or what we could look at. So uh, it's all throughout the three step process. The goal is to kill the deal, right? Mm -hmm. And just make sure it doesn't work, doesn't work, doesn't work. And then if it sifts through those three steps, uh, if it sifts through the first step, then it comes to the, the larger team, including myself as a CEO of the organization. And we have conversations on whether we have to the next steps. So it's very systematized, uh, but it's a lot of time uh, for sure <laughs> to yeah. spend on it. But, you know, that's our passion. That's, yeah, that's great. And you, you touched on it there is that diversification that you guys are looking at, right? Yeah. Uh, what, what, you know, most, a lot of people will say, find one asset class, you know, and I'm not saying right or wrong. I'm just playing contrary here to what you're saying. And this, that find one asset class, learn that find one city, learn that, and then focus in on that and just rinse and repeat, right? What, yeah. what made you want to have that diversification across asset class, across markets? Yeah, it's, it's 
one the the vision of where we want where i want to take the company right if you if you look at just one asset class in one city you probably have one to two opportunities a year right that you could be looking at and over a trajectory of three to five years that could easily take you to great financial freedom and you know living life on your terms and that might be the end goal for a lot of people that are investing in real estate, which is fantastic, right? Um, my goal is to build a, a, a very large scale business, bringing my competency on the consulting side to create ideally a Fortune 100 firm, right? So for that to happen, the scale of investments that we perform has to be different, right? So uh, just because of that vision, uh, it allows me to look at why should I be tied up with just one market which could be priced very high and you, you might tend to make mistakes uh, if you get impatient by not investing for a few months right so once you start thinking about it as a business that is so scalable you have to employ a lot of different competencies and skill sets to the table right and you can easily find that especially on assets that people are not touching right for example next year hotels maybe in summertime or end of next year might come into great deals as they get some of them gets foreclosed or go to the bank or some of them are start picking up. There's always opportunities to find in specific asset classes and specific areas that if you just have a tunnel vision while you will be successful, you might miss out on those great and tremendous potential opportunities that might be existing. So I like to keep an open mind and a broader exposure and that's just how I've built the company around. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And I think with the systemat systemization that you've been putting into place, you know, uh, as you're learning something, you're systemizing that and it, it kind of gives you that freedom, right? Because if you have yeah. systems for everything, it gives you that freedom to look at a other asset class, looks at different market, and you have yeah. a system to do everything and to analyze everything and to, to figure stuff out. I, th I think it gives you that freedom to, to do that. Um, you mentioned there earlier that about office, you guys are looking at office right now, right? I'd be interested to hear you. Um, your opinion on that because I know a lot of people are thinking I don't want to touch office but, but <laughs> you know that it, it, that's a, a broad statement right it doesn't mean that it's you know not and it can't work and it can't be a good investment right now yeah again it's a contrarian thesis right there could, there are several several offices that would be coming into the market and I'm sure the overall pattern of people trying to stay remote will, would be a long-term pattern Right, but there is iconic, sometimes iconic office buildings. Like if you take a FedEx facility, for example, do you FedEx workers have a choice to not work there, right? But that could be considered an office or an industrial complex. Would you in invest in that, right? So you gotta think about that. What, what about an office with any other type of, let's say call centers or other types of employees that physically have to be there. They have tied up for 10, 15 year leases. So to me, again, generalizing any sort of asset class allows you to discount potential opportunities. Now, on the flip side, you can have a shiny object syndrome and you could have a lot of opportunities <laughs> that you start looking around as a squirrel and you don't want even to do that. So there has to be a healthy balance on discipline, on types of markets, types of returns, um, what type of asset class um, and what type of, you know, structure, et cetera, that needs to be honed in. And it comes down to criteria and learning curve, right? So that's the reason why we haven't invested yet in mobile home parks or self storage, because we don't understand the, the business enough, nor do we have operational partnerships in that arena that we can trust that allows us to scale in that direction. So it's only a handful of asset classes that we right now exploring and ensuring that we keep it open with an open mind towards yeah and how are you managing to find that healthy balance because that shiny uh, object syndrome is very <laughs> i know it personally i know yeah. it's very real how do you how are you finding that balance it's uh, it's been a trial and error right it's uh, it's a few failures right to understand an evolution of what your criteria should be so establishing a criteria for your team that everybody aligns to and then creating a funnel like i mentioned that three-step process allows you to have a team that might be looking at 100 deals a month but then 
when it comes across my desk, by that time it's five deals, right? And maybe two of them that we might be putting offers on. Um, so it, it allows us to narrow down and you have to cut down some of the noise around it, trust the people that you have partnered with to do their job and their responsibility and institute those processes uh, that allows you to create that funnel. It's, it's hard, right? You got to first do trial and error. You got to say, oh yeah, I, I, I would like to invest in that. And then you're like, oh, numbers don't work. Well, let's back off. Maybe this is our criteria. And that, so each asset class gives us a, a different level of learning curve, maturity, uh, but the one fortunate thing is you finding a person who is operationally competent and invested in that asset class and gone into the depth of that asset class allows you to have a great sounding board to say, does this make you in sense, right? And that, that's, that's what we've been fortunate with for offices, for hotels, for new development and uh, multifamily. I think, that's, I think that's great. I think, I think that that's something that everyone can learn from is rather than looking at the asset class, and I'm seeing, okay, is it a good investment? And I know you guys are kind of doing that. You're, you're more looking at who do we have to work with on this asset class, right? Rather than us having to learn yeah. from A to Z, everything about that asset class, how, yeah. how it works and everything, who do we have to work with on this? And if we don't have a partner that we can partner, that we trust, that we like to work with on this asset, it's not for us right now until we find that partner. And I think that's huge because, yeah. again, go, talking about that scaling and being in different asset classes with that, you don't have to be that expert, right? You can learn over time and become that expert, but you're relying on someone who is that expert already and, and using those expertise to, to essentially be that expert without being it. You know, I think that's brilliant. I love that. I think that's yeah. great. The, uh, two, the two assets that you've recently been awarded and you guys have, um, uh, you, you're saying you guys are 100% in charge of that, right? There's no co-sponsors or... No, there are co-sponsors. Yeah, there's an operating partners, co-sponsors. Yeah, the ones. Oh, the ones that we are we are awarded. Those are the ones that we're doing soup to nuts. Yes, that's what I mean. Yeah. So, how, yeah. how is your how is your role changing in, in in the deals that you've just been awarded? Yeah, it's it's a tremendous amount of work. Right? <laughs> it's everything from insurance quote to talking to three different brokers to lining up property management firms to walking three four hundred units it's all on you, right? And setting up the investment for success, um, more co-sponsors allow you to divide that responsibility up. Um, so it's been a great learning exercise from that perspective to do everything on your own. Um, but again, it, from my vantage point is just building relationships, right? So we, through this effort, we found a property management firm that we form programmatic relationships uh, with in a few states um, and allows us to streamline, you know, the property management percentage, at ethics, you know, what kind of expectations between ownership and property management companies should be, et cetera. So I, again, it, it's looking long-term and the, the long-term focus allows us to be okay with some of the bumps in the road as, as you evolve and learn. Uh, in some of these uh, one-off transactions. Yeah, very cool, very cool. I think it's fascinating what, what you've been able to uh, achieve in, in such a short amount of time. You know, like this year, just, you decided that commercial was the space for you and you yeah. guys are growing. And I believe if we speak in the next six months, uh, your portfolio will be, you know, exponentially yeah. bigger, you know. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I'm yeah. positive of it. So I love yeah. that. I love um, I love how you look at everything. You know, you have that contrarian view, right? Um, you know, another Warren Buffett group. This is more famous. I hadn't heard the shovel one, but this is, you know, be be fearful when others are greedy, be greedy when others are fearful. Yeah, it's kind of yeah, a, exactly. There's an approach now. You guys are going head, 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 strong into the head first, sorry, into the, everything that's going on. So I love that. Um, and I love how you were able to systemize everything and, you know, build that team yeah. around you and rely on other people as well. Because I think that's a, something that some people have a hard time is letting go of responsibility, right? But if you want to grow, you've got to systematize it and let it go and have, find people that are c capable of implementing the systems that you put in place. So I think, I think that's great. I think it's exciting what, what you're doing. I, I love everything that you're doing. So it's, it's great, but this show is called wrestling with real estate, right? So um, I like to ask some real estate related wrestling questions. Um, yeah. so, so the first question is not, not so much real estate related, but still a bit of fun is what would your wrestling name be? If you had to pick a wrestling name for oh. yourself, what would it be? 
<laughs> Probably be Nacho Libre. <laughs> but, uh, Libre. I, yeah, I strive to not take myself too seriously, I guess. Okay. You know, cool. I enjoy the journey, the ups and downs, the failures along with its successes and uh, enjoy every moment of my life. And I'm a very positive person just naturally. So I guess uh, that, that would be a good, hilarious name. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, every wrestler has a special move. What would your special move be in real estate? So what is your strength in real estate, you think? Yeah, my, I mean, it's a, it's a combination of patience and focus, right? It, I have a very long-term vision um, so day to day ups and downs don't just phase me. And I'm an extremely, extremely patient man. Um, and you can tell that by, uh, this not, no, no gray hair and five-year-old twins. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that has helped me with all aspects of life and just building a business, you, you know, it takes several years, you know, it, every level would take a different level of uh, understanding, competency, uh, mentorships, coaching, partnerships, uh, and, you know, struggles, and be, I'm fully prepared for it. Very cool, very cool. What's been the biggest body slam you think you've taken in your real estate investing career? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I think one partnership, uh, and this was one of the bigger assets, close to 400 units we were about to take, and I had personally invested a few hundred hours along with a handful of partners. It was very exciting opportunity. Um, but you know, through the evolution of that journey of due diligence, found out that, you know, there were a couple of partners whose values were not aligning and just the asset itself was not as promising as we had emotionally invested ourselves into. So it was a combination of that that you, you it would have elevated us to you know double our portfolio in the next month or so um so hard to walk away from but as long as you recognize that your fiduciary responsibility towards your investors and the fact that you're building a business with a brand associated with it right that people uh would want to subscribe to um at some point you just have to make those tough decisions and we did that um, but it was, it was, again, great learning exercise. It wasn't a, a body slam that like Undertaker, we didn't get about, <laughs> get, get up on, but uh, we were back and we were, we were doing uh, some other opportunities and chasing them. So excited about those. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't get put in a casket, right? That's the main. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. And sometimes it's the deals you don't do are some, sometimes the best deals, right? You know? Yes, absolutely. Um, so was there a moment that you were standing on the top rope getting ready to jump? What was it and how did you overcome it? Yeah, it was uh, the transition from single family to multifamily investment was a big deal for me, right? I, uh, when I started single family uh, investing business in 2019, again, just my natural way of thinking, I quickly scaled it with five employees and we were doing a lot of transactional flipping of houses. Uh, it was, you know, monetarily, financially, very successful, but became a second job. And so I wasn't happy with the direction it was going. Um, and here was commercial, which was getting to be my calling. So how do I shut down my single family business or do I slow it down and uh, go into full, full head on into something that I truly believed was my passion? Um, so I struggled with it quite a bit um, just at the end of 2019, beginning of 2020. Um, and found myself a, a coach, um, Jason Dries, and uh, he really helped uh, align my mind into what makes sense and why am I meant to be building a business in a specific way, not the transactional way, uh, with the impact and the legacy that I always aspired towards. And that made it very easy decision. And so I shut down a very successful business, which you know obviously is hard to do. Um, to jump double down into the multifamily and commercial space. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. That's, that's, that is interesting because it's 
once you have success in one thing, right, it's not so easy to just jump from something else because you have that success and you see it, and you, feel, you can feel it. But to, 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 to do that, that is a big jump. And um, yeah, you almost had to walk down a mountain and go back up another mountain. It's, it, it comes with a different level of learning and it just, it's hard. It's hard to do. Yeah, but I'm sure you're glad that you have, right? It's, it's <laughs> very positive. Yeah. Very positive. Very cool, very cool. Well, thank you so much for taking the time today to, to be here and to share your, your awesome journey. And um, I'm excited, so excited to see what your future holds. That, you know, it's going to be, you have a big and bright future. I can kind of tell that for sure. <laughs> um, but before we go, how can people reach out to you or, or find out more about what you're up to next? Yeah, absolutely. They can uh, reach out to me at uh, our our website, uh, through our website, and schedule a call with me. I'm available on Facebook, but our website is www.exponential-equity.com. So it's Exponential Equity is our brand. Um, and yeah, I'd love to connect with whoever's thinking about jumping into real estate, investing in real estate, or just uh, curious about, you know, what, what we're doing and you know, subscribing to our journey, we'll be happy to connect. Very cool. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I'll put the link in the description below so people can find you there. Well, thank you so much, Amal. Uh, I really enjoyed today's interview. Thank you for making the time. It was an absolute pleasure speaking with you. Likewise. Thank you so much. I really appreciate and uh, had a fun time interacting with you.